God speaks to those who say they serve him, and he says they're lost. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hemp. And I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery TV, where we go through the book from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. It is a very interesting book. It's God's book. Corey also helps us learn more. Corey? We're going to be taking a look at the ancient practice of bread stamping and how that applies to our passage in Jeremiah. All right, very good. What'd you do, Jen? Well, today my title is, Are We Fated? Okay, so that's a really good one. So now Ryan is here to tell us what he's doing, Ryan. Well, in today's reading, God calls out nations from the farthest corners of the earth, one of which is Edom. Today we discover just who exactly these Edomites were. All right, very good. That is interesting. We have a lot to cover today. And as we study Jeremiah 7 through 9, let's focus on this one incident where God speaks to us. What is God saying? Let's find out. Jeremiah 8, verses 1 through 7. At that time, says the Lord, they shall bring out the bones of the kings of Judah, and the bones of its princes, and the bones of the priests, and the bones of the prophets, and the bones of the inhabitants of Jerusalem out of their graves. They shall spread them before the sun and the moon and all the host of heaven, which they have loved, and which they have served, and after which they have walked, which they have sought, and which they have worshipped. They shall not be gathered nor buried. They shall be like refuse on the face of the earth. Then death shall be chosen rather than life by all the residue of those who remain of this evil family, who remain in all the places where I have driven them, says the Lord of hosts. Moreover, you shall say to them, thus says the Lord, will they fall and not rise? Will one turn away and not return? Why has this people slidden back, Jerusalem, in a perpetual backsliding? They hold fast to deceit. They refuse to return. I listened and heard, but they do not speak aright. No man repented of his wickedness, saying, What have I done? Everyone turned to his own course as the horse rushes into the battle. Even the stork in the heavens knows her appointed times, and the turtle dove, the swift, and the swallow observe the time of their coming. But my people do not know the judgment of the Lord. Jeremiah chapter 8, verses 1 through 7. In the Bible, the people of the Lord are called or referred to as Israel. Despite being divided into northern Israel and the southern tribes of Judah, they were chosen by God through Abraham. Now, God called Abraham to separate from his heritage and leave the place where he grew up. God was talking to him in a new land, the new place where his children would be the ones to look after the property for God. They began that way, but something went wrong. The people did not stay true to the Lord. They turned away from God and their minds went into a different direction, which changed the outlook of their life. God would need to do something directly to change the natural flaws, not the natural laws, but the natural flaws of sinful man. The Lord promised to give a special revelation, and this was Jesus Christ. Today, Christians believe in Jesus and the events of his life, the only begotten Son of God, born of a virgin, who lived a perfect life, died on the cross to pay the cost of our sins, and rose again on the third day, conquering death once and for all, giving us the gift of eternal life. Praise God. I mean, that's what we praise the Lord for, because God did this. He's done so much. Somebody said to me once, I, I don't know why he doesn't just show up on the uh, three networks news. And I say to him, well, you know, God has done so much. You want him to do that too? And it's really true. The Lord has done amazing things for us. Now, take your Bible guide and turn to today's passage as we focus on this, because it's a good one. Now, I want to remind you that if you don't have a Bible guide, why not? You can write to us using the addresses and the phone number at the bottom of the screen, 
or you can go to www.bibledescoverytv.com, bibledescoverytv.com. When you go there, you can make a donation in any amount. Click on the Bible guide and it'll take you to a page where you can make a donation. And let me say thank you to everyone who's done that. We're not going to tell you the amount. God will speak that to you. We trust the work of the Holy Spirit. He will speak to you what he wants you to do. And when you make that donation, uh, it'll take you to the PDF files. The PDF files are files that are created so that you can print them off. And also we can send you a guide as well. Now, this is important as we look at it, the judgment of God. A lot of people talk about God as, as uh, you know, don't judge because God doesn't judge. Hold, hold on a minute. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says we are not to judge because we are not God's. God himself is the one who judges the world. And we cannot do that, but God can. The judgment of God, Jeremiah chapter 8. This is absolutely stunning as we begin to read it. And Father, I pray today that we would hear what you're saying. It is important for us to listen to the word of God, Jeremiah your prophet, and hear how you're talking to us today. Help us, Lord, to understand the scripture as we read it in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Now, here is what the Bible says in chapter 8. It says, At that time, says the Lord, they shall bring out the bones of the kings of Judah, and the bones of his princes, and the bones of the priests, and the bones of the prophets, and the bones of the inhabitants of Jerusalem out of their graves. Verse two says, they shall spread them before the sun and the moon and all the host of heaven, which they have loved and which they have served and after which they have walked, which they have sought and which they have worshiped. They shall not be gathered or buried. They shall be like refuse on the face of the earth. And then death shall be chosen rather than life, death rather than life, by all the residue of those who remain of this evil family, who have remained in the place where I have driven them, says the Lord God. What a fascinating passage. You see, God speaks to those who claim to serve him, and he says they're lost. You don't serve me. You say you're mine, but you're not. See, Jesus Christ is the only way to God. Jesus said, no one comes, no one. Now, what part of no one does that mean? No one means no one. It, there's no races here. It's just people, no one, no one, everybody, no one, no one comes to the Lord Jesus Christ, comes to the Father, except through him. And so that's what we need to remember, beloved. We, we talk about Jesus Christ a lot and we speak about him frequently because he is the Lord. He's not a man who came and, you know, God is a good guy. And he's the Lord. He created our life. He created the universe. Jesus Christ is God, fully God and fully man. This is the mystery of the incarnation, the mystery of God. Very interesting, isn't it? Well, let's, let's read on because this gets good. Moreover, you shall say to them, thus says the Lord, will they fall and not rise? Will one turn away and not return? Why has this people slidden back Jerusalem in a perpetual backsliding? They hold fast to deceit. They refuse to return. I listened and heard, but they do not speak aright. No man repented of his wickedness, saying, what have I done? Everyone turned to his own course at the horse rushes into battle. Let me tell you what God has said. Men have consistently chosen against God. God's plan for salvation is presented in hopes that some will return and turn to God. In order to present yourself to God, Jeremiah says, the Old Testament prophet says, we have to say, Lord, forgive me of my sin. Very important. That's in the Old Testament. Now, keep that in mind and let's read on, see what else he says. Now, watch this. 
Jeremiah chapter eight, verse seven, listen carefully. Even the stork in the heavens knows her appointed times and the turtle dove, the swift and the swallow. He says, observe the time of their coming. Pay attention to it. But he says, my people do not know the judgment of the Lord. They don't know. Now, this brings me to the third point. Listen carefully. Knowing God's judgment is critical to avoiding it. If you're going to avoid the judgment of God, then Jesus Christ makes himself known to us. Come to him now. Now's the time for salvation. Now's the time for you to come to Jesus Christ. You say, how can I possibly do that? So easy. When you pray to God, God listens to you. The Lord Jesus Christ hears you, beloved. We need to pray to God and we need to say, Lord Jesus. This is what we say. Talk to God. Don't call an 800 number or buy anything. You talk to the Lord and you say, Lord, listen, I need, I need you in my life. Forgive me of my sin. I've done wrong. And forgive me of my sin. Help me, Lord, to live for you. I give you my life. I give you my life. I'm not going to make any decisions without talking to you. In Jesus' name, amen. It's that prayer, that key prayer. It's so simple and it's so truthful. Today, we don't need to say we're Christians. We need to do the work of being a Christian, which is praying and the Holy Spirit will come into our lives by a gift of God, the promise of the Father. And the Lord Jesus Christ will help us to see, help us to understand and help us to know how to work. We go then into the sanctification process. God uses his Holy Spirit to help us and make us better along the way. Beloved, come to Jesus now. Don't wait for now is your day of salvation. the prophet Jeremiah and the Old Testament book that's named after him, but we're going to be attempting to establish a foundation of history. Uh, and on that foundation, the idea is you will be able to better understand and interpret uh, what you read in the Old Testament book of Jeremiah. Well, it's time now to continue on with our Bible study, and today's reading includes Jeremiah chapter 7 to 9. And I decided to focus in on Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 25 and 26, in which God calls out several nations, one of which is Edom. Now, if you're new to the Bible, you might be wondering just who exactly these Edomites were. So today, we're going to trace these people through history. It begins with a man named Esau, the brother of Jacob. This is his story. As Isaac is unwittingly blessing his younger son Jacob instead of Esau, he proclaims, May God give you of the dew of heaven, of the fatness of the earth, and plenty of grain and wine. This was a promise of agricultural prosperity. And then came a promise of lordship. Let people serve you, and nations bow down to you. Be master over your brethren, and let your mother's sons bow down to you. And finally, cursed be everyone who curses you, and blessed be those who bless you. This connected the patriarchal blessing with the Abrahamic covenant. And when Esau learns all this has been given to Jacob, he cries bitterly and laments, Have you only one blessing, my father? Bless me, me also, O oh my father. While there is a blessing given to Esau at this point, and while it does appear somewhat similar in certain Bible translations to the blessing given to Jacob, it is in fact the opposite of what was promised to Jacob. Indeed, though the English reads, Behold, your dwelling shall be of the fatness of the earth. In the Hebrew text, there is a min partitive, so literally it should read, Behold, your dwelling shall be away from the fatness of the earth. The next phrase, of the dew of heaven, also has a min partitive, literally meaning away from the dew of heaven. So since Esau's place is away from this and away from that, Esau will not inherit the land. Whatever his blessing, it will be away from the land. He will not be the inheritor of this land. Jacob will be. Isaac continues his blessing of Esau and makes three prophecies regarding his nation Edom, the fulfillments of which Jewish scholar Arnold Fruchtenbaum has documented. 
The first prophecy is by your sword you shall live. In other words, he will sustain himself by plunder, and he will live a life of a marauding dwelling nation. One example of the fulfillment of this is in Numbers 20, 14 through 21. The second prophecy is, and you shall serve your brother. Indeed, Edom was defeated by Saul and then subjugated by David. There was also a failed revolt under Solomon. Edom rebelled from Joram, but was subdued again by Amaziah. Yet it shall come to pass, said Jacob, when you shall break loose, that you shall shake his yoke from off your neck. This break happened first under Joram and then under Ahaz. In subsequent history, when the Jews went into Babylonian captivity, the Edomites left their territory at Mount Seir in the Transjordan and moved into the southern part of Judah, where they became known as Idumeans. In addition, later these Idumeans were conquered by one of the descendants of the Maccabees, John Hyrcanos, who conquered them in 129 BC, forcibly converted them to Judaism, and then incorporated Idumea into the Jewish Judean state. Eventually, these converted Idumeans produced the dynastic rule of the House of Herod. So I hope this brief history of Edom helps to bring some better context and understanding to today's reading, and that this will help us as we move forward in history to the time of King Herod. Now, you may have noticed that in addition to the nation of Edom, God also called out Ammon and Moab in Jeremiah 9.26, and next week we'll trace their roots as well. It really helps as we're reading through the Bible to understand the history, because the Bible builds upon itself. That's why I think it's important to read the whole Bible, not just the New Testament. Corey, what did you study today? Thanks, Ryan. Today, I'm going to be taking my cue from Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 18. Now, in this chapter, the prophet is talking about the different uh, idolatrous practices that the people of Judah are engaged in. And in verse 18, he specifically is talking about the entire family's involvement in the worship of the so-called Queen of Heaven. Now, in this verse, it says that the children gather the wood, the father makes the fire, and the mother uh, uh, kneads the dough and shapes it or stamps it uh, into special bread for the Queen of Heaven. Now, this practice is really well attested to not only in the Bible, but also in the ancient world. So you and I are going to be focusing in on this concept of shaping, molding, or stamping ancient bread. It had some purely decorative, but also some more nefarious religious purposes. Take a look. It's been estimated that bread and cereal grains made up as much as 50% of the diet of ancient Israelites. It's no wonder then that bread came in all different shapes and sizes. The ancients didn't just stop at shaping and molding bread, they also made stamps to impress their loaves and cakes. Clay, stone, or metal stamps were utilized elsewhere in everyday life. Signet and cylinder seals were taken as a person's official signature. Clay jars were stamped for administrative, storage, and economic purposes. And bricks and tiles could be stamped for the glory of their commissioning king. Ancient bread stamping is known to us from literary texts, artistic representations, the physical stamps themselves, and even in the famous case of the city of Pompeii, a preserved loaf. In the Pompeii loaf's case, the round bread was divided into wedges, tied about with a piece of rope that would have made a convenient carrying string, and stamped with the name of the baker. This demonstrates for us a couple of the basic reasons for ancient stamping. One, it could identify the bakery and thus be good for publicity and accountability. And two, in some Roman cities, it was common for people to bring their prepared raw loaves to a bakery equipped with bread ovens. A family stamp would ensure they got their appropriate loaves back. This practice of bread stamping goes back farther in time than the Roman period. As far back as the Neolithic age, archeologists have found evidence of it. Again, there was more than one reason to stamp a loaf. It could be done purely for the sake of decoration, adding beauty to what was otherwise a laborious task. It could also be done superstitiously, stamping on messages of health, protection, and petitions to various gods. In this same vein, stamped bread was often used religiously. Special cakes and loaves would be stamped with the name of gods and goddesses, sometimes first forming them into the shape of a more expensive offering, like an animal, and then stamped. This ritualistic bread would often be blessed by the pagan priests and distributed to the revelers to enjoy. This brings us to stamped Jewish and Christian bread. 
In Judaism, stamped bread had an added benefit of labeling it kosher, and the practice of stamping special bread for biblical festivals may have been adopted. In Eastern and Greek Orthodox Christianity, bread stamping is still a part of the Eucharist. This practice may have developed quite naturally in the early church. By the second century, it was common practice for the body of believers in a city to receive bread given to them by the area's bishop for a weekly communion. In a world where there was no common church building, this shared bread represented the unity of believers within their diversity. Since the practice of stamping bread was thoroughly entrenched in Roman society, it wouldn't have taken a huge leap for someone to start stamping this shared bread to mark out its special importance, all the more so because it held a unique religious value. So there were obviously many different ways of the people engaging in idolatry, and Jeremiah actually talks about quite a few of them. This is just one, the one involving the, the shaping and the molding, the stamping of bread uh, for worship for this specific goddess of heaven, uh, this mother of heaven. Uh, you know, there, were, there was a whole pantheon of other gods that the Judeans had gotten themselves involved in. And as we continue to read throughout the book of Jeremiah, you're going to pick up on some of these ancient practices uh, that that are really interesting and they'll open up our eyes to the, the whole picture that God was painting, the whole case that he was building against uh, the pe these people who had been in covenant with him. So not a happy thing to study, but definitely necessary as we continue through the book of Jeremiah. You know, Corey, and I think that there's been a lot of people who have uh, recognize this today and actually the worship of other gods continues and uh, it, it does carry on and uh, so it's interesting to study this. Thank you, Corey. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, just so you know, camera four, go for it. Camera four is here. Corey's right there. Over there. <laughs> over and here, in, not too far away. <laughs> yes, Ryan's over there. <laughs> so we are, we are distancing ourselves from each other for safety's sake. And uh, we're just continuing until we can get closer together. All right. Now, yes. uh, what did you do? This is a very interesting portion of scripture in Jeremiah. There is so much to unpack here. And I'm, you know, looking at starting from verse four, it really it's titled in here, the peril of false teaching. And we hear about how far Jerusalem has slidden away. And it even talks about the people slidden back, Jerusalem in a perpetual backsliding position. And as I read, I thought, you know, there are many of us, there are many people who as a young person or even as a child started out in church, going to Sunday school. I read letter after letter after letter from parents and grandparents who talk about raising their children, going to church and talking about the Bible and over time have slipped away uh, and are praying for their return. Maybe that's you. Maybe you've caught this program and, and there's something deep inside of you that remembers about God, that remembers some of the songs and some of the things that you heard growing up as a young person, or maybe you're just brand new to the faith. It talks about God looking for his people to be right with him. God says, I listened and heard, but they do not speak aright. No man repented of his wickedness saying, what have I done? So many of us out there have claim that we follow Jesus, but we don't ask, we don't think about following God. We, we make up our own ways to follow God and we make up our own gods. We don't even say, what have I done? We don't really care. Some people don't really care. And God says, everyone turned to his own course as the horse rushes into the battle. What a way to describe hardness and stubbornness and I'm going to do my own way as a horse rushing into the battle. And then he switches that word picture into talking about birds. So we're now we're, we're changing from a mighty horse and he says, even the stork in the heavens knows her appointed times and the turtle dove, the swift and the swallow observe the time of their coming. God is pointing out that even the birds know instinctively they know. He says, but my people 
do not know the judgment of the Lord. Rod, we are in serious times. We are. We, there is nothing the same now as was in 2019. Mm -hmm. And it changed, it seems, overnight. And we need to make sure that we are following God. God is looking for his people to be right with him. The verses go on later on to demonstrate a people, God's people, who have faded into the culture of those around them. And they have left his word and left the personhood of God. I want to say today, let's make sure that we have not, as believers in Jesus Christ, as those people who proclaim that we are Christians, that we follow God, that we haven't forgot God's way, that we haven't swayed off into the culture and into teachings that take us away from the Word of God, that may have truths in them, but when you believe and when you read the Word of God and it doesn't line up, that you are open enough, that you are moldable enough in the hands of God to, to learn and to come back to where God has called us to be. I think that's a really important message for all of us who claim to be Christians and followers of God. This, our God is the Heavenly Father, the one who breathed out the galaxies, who's created everything and who wants nothing more than for your time to come to Him as a child comes to a father in praise and in repentance and in relationship. Why would we want to miss out on that rod? Why would any of us want to miss out on that? So make sure to get your heart right with God. Spend time with Him. Spend time in His Word. He loves you so very, very much. Don't be compared to that stubborn horse, but as even a bird who knows the time of his Lord. <laughs>